Hello guys, Zeo Legend is back. After a 5 month hiatus, I decided to finally make a brand new video. I hope that all of my subscribers are doing great. I've got no time to waste on introductions, so let's begin. Football is in crisis. Every football or sports activity in general is postponed, starting with UEFA delaying the 2020 Euros. Then most football associations followed suit and delayed league and cup games until further notice. Even the Tokyo Olympic Games were postponed. In order to combat such a highly infectious disease, taking desperate measures is necessary in these tough times. If the governing football bodies were late by only a few days, the body count of infected people would have probably tripled which could have resulted in a dire situation for the healthcare system. Fortunately, they reacted just in time. Though, unfortunately, we lost some familiar faces. Lorenzo Sanz, an ex-Real Madrid president, Luciano Federici, Jose Luis Capon, Goyo Benito, Zakaria Cometti, Arnold Sowinski, and Miguel Jones were all former footballers who lost their lives due to the disease. And also not forgetting Pep Guardiola's mother who lost hers a few days ago. May their lives rest in peace. The most asked question in the football community these days is when will football return? Lucky for you guys, I did my research and I have some answers. Resuming sport activities on April is a big no-no. Unless you're Belarusia who decided to continue as if nothing happened, but under one condition, playing the remaining games behind closed doors. The most logical time and the least risk-heavy financially and for medical reasons is to resume the football season on July if the curve flattens and things return to a semi-normal state. As FIFA medical chief Michael Duguay warns clubs that a May restart could punish us all. In his opinion, even a mid-May restart seems too early. Duguay insists that football authorities must heed medical advice before acting unilaterally and potentially getting their priorities wrong by putting financial considerations such as broadcasting contracts first. A month ago, Spanish league boss Javier Tebas, who is part of a working group set by UEFA, said there was a growing consensus among the big leagues for a mid-May restart. But Duguay said there was no justification for such an early restart, even behind closed doors. Since all countries have closed their borders, and the decision to restart football is in the hands of football associations, depending on how their country handled the spread of the virus. Some leagues might resume a month before what was predicted a few weeks ago. Looking at the infection stats by country, Germany is the only country out of the five in the top five leagues, which includes Spain, England, Italy and France, that has the lowest death rates with only 2% out of the infected. Their health system has managed the outbreak efficiently compared to the other four countries with more than 10% of death rates. Unsurprisingly, the Bundesliga could be the first of Europe's top five leagues to return to action with chief executive of the DFL Christian Seifert saying they are planning to restart at the beginning of May. The matches will be played in closed doors, but even though the stadiums will be empty, at least 240 people from match officials, managerial staff, technical staff and more will be required to ensure that a Bundesliga match can proceed and be televised. Italy, on the other hand, could see their season extended until September or October after being pressured by UEFA to not abandon the hopes of finishing the season and to restart as soon as the government gives them the green light. But there are multiple countries who put the lives of their citizens on a higher pedestal than financial gain and decided to end their league as soon as possible. The Netherlands Prime Minister confirmed that no events will take place before next September, meaning that the Eredivisie 2019-2020 season has come to an end. In an unprecedented move, Belgium has abandoned the rest of the season and crowned Club Bruges champion. Despite UEFA issuing a warning against ending leagues early and threatening expulsion from the Champions League and Europa League, with the league's board of directors claiming that even games behind closed doors could theoretically be possible, but the additional pressure they place on health services should be avoided outside of Europe and as of the 9th of April, Mauritius is the only African nation to decide cancelling its professional league season. And for our last news, this will shock most of you guys. 
but there happens to be talks about ending the current season and maybe stopping any football activity for the next one and a half years. So, is ending the current season an option? This one is pretty straightforward. Well, it's a no from me. Why so? Well, for two reasons, a financial one and a moral one. When I say moral, I mean how do you explain ending the season just like that and literally negate all the effort done by the tens of thousands of footballers for nothing? It will be worse if they decide that the current first position holders are to be crowned champions of their leagues, even though other teams still have a chance to win the title. What about the continental qualifiers? Does a fourth position team deserve qualifying to next year's Champions League more than the fifth positioned one, even though the latter played against tougher opponents and its remaining games are easier? What about relegation and promotion? How do you explain the decision of discontinuing the current season to a fan of a second division's team that is having its best run in the last 10 years with a chance of getting promoted and playing with the big dogs? And if football associations decide to simply abandon the season, how do you explain it to a Liverpool who's been trying since 1990 to win the league? Yo, Liverpool fans, if this happens by any means, though it's highly unlikely, I suggest using the rope. Still, this is less of a problem compared to the financial damages. Guys, do you know how much money is at stake? Well, according to the international accountancy firm KPMG, they estimated that Europe's major five leagues stand to lose up to 4 billion euros if the season is scrapped. Well, for my American viewers, that's around 4 billion and 350 million US dollars. But the most affected by this situation are lower division clubs. 50% of the second division teams are very much in danger to file for bankruptcy if the season is cancelled. In Spain, media pro's boss Rures claims that a July restart would save the season and reduce 700 million euros of losses. The financial losses depend mainly on the club's popularity and marketability. The five major sources of income affected by this outbreak are ticket sales, TV rights and prize money, transfers, club memberships and merch, and of course, sponsorships. Big and popular clubs like Barcelona and Real Madrid do not really count on their match attendance for monetary gain, as they have other more lucrative ways to earn their money. However, smaller clubs will be hurt quite severely in their pockets when playing behind closed doors. This resembles the case of small businesses that went or are undergoing bankruptcy in this outbreak. Yeah, this is pretty bad. Remember when I released last year a video on the UEFA Super League, right? And how it will benefit big clubs and hurt small clubs, ultimately destroying the football we love for good. I highly suggest looking up the 2024 UEFA Super League tournament project or you can simply watch my video that I'll link summarizing this project in detail. Secondly, is TV rights, or as what I like to call it, the breadbasket of football. Last season, Liverpool earned $140 million just from the Premier League TV rights, without accounting for prize money, which makes it a staggering $185 million. Yeah, US dollars. Even last place, Huddersfield Town earned a share of $116 million. Another example to emphasize how much crucial is TV revenue, in Spain, after the end of the 2017-2018 season, Barcelona earned $168 million, which was approximately 24%, a quarter of Barca's total revenue in that season. And this is not including revenue from tournaments like the Champions League. But since no games are airing, clubs will see their revenue drop during these months. In France, both domestic League One broadcasters Canal Plus and Bean Sports are withholding a combined sum of $165 million of TV rights due to a lack of advertisement money in the month of March. In Germany, Sky Dutchland, the domestic rights holder, is yet to pay the final advancement of $325 million. This creates a cash flow problem. Now, football clubs need to find other ways to pay salaries and taxes. In this situation, they resorted to cutting their players' wages and calling for help to the government and banks. Well, this threatens to disrupt 
and impair the ability of FIFA's member associations and other football organizations, such as leagues and clubs, to develop, finance, and run football activities at all levels of the game, including professional, non-professional, youth, and grassroots. In response to the crisis, the FIFA World Federation will draw from its financial reserves, which stood at around $2.75 billion in 2019, and they will take on the game's institutional crisis and redistribute $6 million to each member association across a four-year program. This means that they'll give $6 million to every football association, be it the Brazilian, the Nigerian, the Japanese, you get the idea. The transfer market is also collapsing. It could lose $9.5 billion of value. According to an analysis by the International Center of Football Studies, the CIS Football Observatory, the value of player transfer market will fall by 28% if no more matches are played and no player contracts are renewed until June 30. The total transfer value of the Big 5 League players might plummet from $35 billion to $25 billion, ripping the heart out of a transfer business that has been a financial life support system for many clubs who survive on selling their best players to bigger clubs. Clubs like Barcelona, Manchester City and Liverpool will be experiencing the biggest losses and will see the total value of their top 20 players go from 10 digits to 9 digits. For example, Paul Pogba. His value will drop from $71 million to $38 million, nearly half of his former price tag. Well, the price drop depends on the player's contract, age, and performances. Mid-range clubs who rely on selling their talents to maintain economic growth and stability will see their profits dwindle, either due to their players losing half of their market value or selling less players to what was expected before the outbreak. In the long run, sponsors might affect football's revenue streams the most, with consumers nowadays only spending money on essentials like food, toilet paper, and rent, leaving the likes of the oil industry, the entertainment industry, and much more in a state of limbo. One of the most affected industries are transport companies, precisely airlines, with everyone confined at home for safety reasons and airports void of any human interaction, this sector is experiencing heavy losses that might hinder the spending power of clubs. Real Madrid, one of the clubs concerned with this issue, who still have a contract with their shirt sponsor Dubai Airline Emirates, may see their yearly $75 million earnings thrown away. But a recent cash infusion by Dubai's government may bring a glimmer of hope to Real Madrid's board. Though big clubs with contracts tied to airline companies like Barcelona and Manchester City are crossing their fingers by not rushing to renew or look for other deals, the smaller clubs don't have the means to wait until the end of the crisis and risk bankruptcy. Flybe, one of the largest British airline companies based in England, was forced to declare bankruptcy in the first week of March after bookings dried out due to the outbreak, and as a result of this, Exeter City Football Club an English League 2 team ended their contract with Flybe, their shirt sponsor, and signed a new three-year deal with Carpet Right, UK's largest retailer of carpets, flooring, and beds. After talking in a handful of minutes about the financial consequences and how clubs are reacting to this outbreak, let's talk about the players and the staff who are responsible for football's worldwide success. Looking at the stats and predictions, Football will be on hold for at least 60 to 120 days. It is uncertain when football will resume. A 90-day break from football is a lot more than what footballers or athletes in general are used to during summer breaks, which usually last for less than 6 weeks. This break will logically have a bad toll on their fitness, negatively affecting their match performances. Yeah, players won't be in their best form. Even worse, fears of getting infected will challenge their mental health. Speaking of mental health, the Global Players Union FIFA Pro is warning of a massive rise in players reporting symptoms of depression or anxiety, with 22% of women players and 13 of men. What's the cause though? Well, first of all, these stats include all football players, and most footballers do not play in the first or second divisions. They are just like you and me, 
with normal lives, they are more similar to average society than what most people think. They have average salaries, most of them do not earn above six figures. So with the recent pay cuts and the uncertainty about their future, the numbers of depressed players rose. This is similar to when a player experiences a massive injury of more than six months. They begin losing appetite and interest for the sports and they lack energy and self-esteem. You know, these things can have bad consequences on your performances once you're injury free and ultimately your future in sports in general. Coaches can also experience this problem if they lose their minds the strong bonds of iron that used to hold together the mental strength of their teams might collapse. If clubs are given the green light to resume training, I think that coaches should focus a lot more on improving the team's chemistry, tactical and spatial awareness. They must adapt and align their strategy and game tactics to a more technical game plan rather than a physical oriented one. This will prove to be a hell of a challenge to coaches all around the world as none of them have the experience to work in these conditions. While the focus of the football world is mainly on financials, no one is asking the real question and the most sensible one. What about fans? Fans constitute at least 20% of revenue from ticket sales and merchandise. It can go up to 30% if you count club memberships. The numbers are much higher for lower tier clubs. A huge number of people are having economic problems too. Some are losing their jobs, others declared bankruptcy. The consequence of the current crisis will surpass the 28th recession and even the Great Depression of 1929. This means that a big percentage of the football fan base won't spend their money on anything related to entertainment, including football, for the remainder of this year. Plus, the stands might end up half empty for a far simpler reason the fear of getting the infection. I'm pretty sure that we'll see less people go into large gatherings in general till the end of the year. Clubs will also lose on some of their international fans. You are most likely in your 20s, you're sitting on the sofa or laying on your bed watching this video, fearing nothing, your immunity can handle the disease. Probably not caring about that 70 year old who just died a week ago. Well, that 70 year old might have been an avid football supporter. He even attended his local team's matches once a week. In between halves, he'd consume a sandwich made by a food stand located beside the stadium's facilities. And after the game is finished, he enters a local pub and buys a few beers or a coffee to celebrate his team's victory. What if tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of like-minded people just vanish? I mean die due to the outbreak. Well, this means that the local businesses who saw their capital flourish due to their site's approximation with football stadiums will witness a portion of their loyal customers gone. With 90% of deaths affecting the elderly, families whose sole provider is one of them will still have financial problems after life returns to its normal state. Well, I know, the majority of this video sounds kinda pessimistic. so. Let's end it on a positive note. Football will witness a major rule change. According to the IFAB, the International Football Association Board, the body that determines the laws of football since 1886, they agreed on a new handball law that will be introduced to the football scene when the season restarts or in the month of June. The major change includes using the so-called t-shirt line to differentiate between the arm and the shoulder for handball decisions. So, in the future when the ball is in contact with a player's hand, it won't be counted as a handball if it touches the t-shirt part of the hand. The handball is one key area where VAR has caused so much confusion, but from now on, the point at which the arm stops and the shoulder begins will be written into the laws of the game as the t-shirt line. A major announcement before I end this video. I started another channel besides this one. It will not be football related as I would like to tackle other historical, scientific, artistic, and internet related subjects. Football is not the only thing that I'm passionate about and I do not want to be stuck doing football related content for eternity. Five years ago I never saw myself talking about football tactics. However, this doesn't mean that I'll stop posting videos on this channel. 
I still have a lot of things to say, loads of more videos are coming, I just feel a bit bored and I want to talk about other things. So I'm inviting you to subscribe to my new and amazing channel and to kickstart it, I'll be making a YouTube series of 3-4 to four videos where I'll discuss everything you need to know about this platform. For example, a guide on how to star and succeed on YouTube, the future of YouTube, are there any video platforms threatening YouTube's video monopoly, and most importantly, how much money do YouTubers earn? Yep, no one outside the YouTube creator hemisphere knows exactly how much they make. Even if you watch all of the videos on the internet, you will never understand how it works. They miss on a lot of important details. Yeah, those videos are full of misinformation. Even some popular YouTubers are ignorant about certain things. So yeah, go subscribe, you're confined at home and you've got nothing to lose. What about this channel? Well, I have some really big surprises for you guys. I just concocted a great concept that will see light in the few coming months. This channel will become one of the best football channels on YouTube. So subscribe, leave a comment, go follow me on Twitter, and many thanks for watching.